Thanks very much for inviting me, and uh, thanks to all the other speakers. This has been a really fascinating sort of whirlwind tour through everything that Transformers have to, op have to offer. Uh, so I'm going to be taking a little bit of a different uh, stance than the previous two talks, and in particular talking about settings where we might want to get around inductive biases. Um, so in the Perceiver line of work, we're really interested in developing general purpose architectures. And by general purpose, I mean really an architecture that in the limit can be applied to almost any domain. And when we're talking about any domain, I really mean any domain. So both perceptual, um, classical, uh, symbolic reasoning tasks, as we see in vision, as we see in language, but also the new kinds of data that we're encountering um, with every new scientific domain that gets pushed. And so really, what we want are arch architectures that can handle micro and macro scale data from all over the world. And um, the, really, the, the, the motivation for this is very pragmatic. If we wanted to develop inductive biases that were appropriate for every one of these domains, we would have to basically de um, devote computer vision-like scales to, e to every one of them. And so just practically, we don't have the person power or the compute power to do this. So to solve everything, we really do need more unified systems. And um, we've been trying to do this um, in the Perceiver line of work, basically by um, building on the transform uh, transformer architecture, but trying to fix some of the, the problems that limit its ability to model data that we see in the world. Um, and so the original um, work that we did on this was uh, in 2021 and 2022, developing the Perceiver and Perceiver I.O. architectures. And just to give you a sense of what we accomplished with these architectures, so this is definitely not the full problem, but we were able to show that um, with a simple architecture that basically um, replaced the original sort of the self-attention at the beginning of a, a transformer with a cross-attention, we could get competitive results on ImageNet without having any 2D convolutions or any patching, which um, in the Vision Transformer looks very much like a 2D convolution. And um, if you want to speed things up, um, you can incorporate inductive biases. So 2D comms do work complementary to this. At the same time, these architectures get state-of-the-art results on dense image tasks, like Centel or Kitty Optical Flow. And they also get competitive results on multimodal uh, data sets. And this is crucial, because when you're dealing with multimodal data, so audio and video at the same time, you really need to uh, basically handle a sort of cross-domain inductive bias, which is very hard to reason about. These same architectures get uh, state-of-the-art or near-state-of-the-art performance on glue language understanding, and crucially, without requiring tokenization. So you, with, with raw bytes, you can get the same performance and um, with a model that's faster in real wall clock terms than a comparable transformer. Um, so these architectures, have, um, we've already started using them quite widely on a range of other tasks. So at DeepMind, we've used these, um, for example, they become, uh, they've become a central part of the multimodal reasoning components of the Flamingo architecture, which does very well on few shot sort of uh, visual question answering and visual language reasoning tasks. And we've also shown how to incorporate these uh, as sort of a way to, to, to use um, inductive biases for 3D-like tasks without having to build architectures that know about 3D. So in this particular work, which was led by an intern, basically we take a structural information that we know is imp important for reasoning about 3D scenes and just pass it in as an array to the architecture. So the architecture can figure out how to handle that information so that it can perform uh, these tasks without knowing anything really about the underlying domain itself. Um, so the, uh, from these, these papers, we've basically been trying to um, incrementally push these architectures to um, work on all, all sorts of domains. And um, to do this, we really need to identify what's missing from these architectures. And um, there are two things I think that are missing. So um, one is that the Perceiver I.O. Arch architecture works well to, um, up to about 100 or 200,000 points. So this works on medium resolution images, but it won't work very well on very high resolution images. And so um, to, to address this, we developed the hierarchical perceiver, which incorporates some ideas, for example, from the SWIN transformer as a way to allow us to apply it to very large inputs. Uh, so we, we can apply these models to, to megapixel uh, image segmentation problems. Um, but the, the, the problem that I think is more important, um, that personally is sort of has bothered me more about these architectures, is that um, they make a very restrictive assumption about how output points are decoded. So in particular, Perceiver I.O. assumes that all of the output points are independently decoded. So this, this restricts its ability to model very complex uh, uh, interdependent relationships. And so um, the work I'm going to, be, going to be focusing on today, the Perceiver, Perce Perceiver AR work gets around this by basically incorpor incorporating autoregressive decoding while keeping all of the principles that make perceivers work.
Okay, so why do we care about generation? So I think the way to think about this is in terms of task generality. So to give you a sense of why task generality um, is a good thing to think about, I'm going to be highlighting two works here. So the first is this, this work on tr Transframer, which was led by Charlie Nash at DeepMind. Basically, what we developed here was a, a UNet architecture that to encode images and then a single transformer decoder that could be used for 30-second um, for long uh, video prediction, the results of which are shown here, but also on a variety of different tasks, including image classification, segmentation, and detection with the same encoder-decoder structure. So all we had to change to get it to apply it to different tasks was the input data and the loss. Otherwise, it's exactly the same architecture, and it works well on a variety of different tasks. Um, at, in parallel, um, work from Google has been developing, um, th has developed this architecture called PixToSeq, which basically um, works for detection and uh, their extensions to segmentation as well. And basically, we cast this problem as a sequence to sequence reasoning task with an input image and then just a generic transformer decoder that allows us to basically reason about decoding the position of bounding boxes in exactly the same way that we would uh, decoding language. So from this point of view, um, when we think about uh, generating uh, any sort of output data, what's the fundamental problem? And I'd argue that one of the main problems that's, fa that's facing us as we try to develop architecture is the problem of building architectures that can condition on the amount of data you need to actually formulate these problems. So um, it, it, for example, if we're trying to um, decode this image, if we're trying to, to generate this image, we might generate this one pixel at a time or one patch at a time. And so let's focus on this patch here. The usual way that we would decode this, so for example, if, um, if we're looking at this particular image, the thing that we actually want to do is look sort of for the mirror reflection of it and just copy that, that data down. And this is a simplified version of what's actually going on, so there are complex statistical dependencies for each of the points. But if we can see these two points, we can very easily model this data. With the, the, um, the computational bottleneck that comes from using very large transformers, we usually are put in a position like this where when we're trying to predict the, the, um, the occupancy of this particular patch, we can only look at the most recent images. So in a raster scan order, this means we can only look at a few rows, which makes the modeling problem very hard because we have to do a hard inference problem that doesn't allow us to exploit the data. So what we want to do is actually increase the context length of transformers so that they can actually model the underlying structure of the data just by looking at it. And um, to see why this is a problem with transformers, um, let's note that um, basically when we're doing a decoder-only transformer autoregression, so if we're, um, if we're trying to predict, uh, for example, uh, this EOS here at the very top, what we end up doing is we spin compute that's proportional to the number of points that we have in our context. And this, this compute is proportional at every single layer. So if we make deeper, deeper architectures and we have wider inputs, we end up um, having a coupled computational requirements. And this means if we try to make deep architectures, we have to limit our self-attention width to actually model things effectively. Um, other, other groups have tried to get around this. I think probably most effectively uh, in the Transformer XL work, which gets around this problem basically by extending the context using a stop gradient to basically allow the past to act as a memory that we then cross attend to um, as, we, as we make these predictions. But um, as I'll show later, this doesn't actually buy you that much in terms of the, uh, the computational overhead that you get, the memory overhead. And so this really does still limit the amount of, uh, the amount of uh, context that you can incorporate. In the perceiver AR work, we use the design principle from a perceiver, so a long context cross attention, followed by a self attention stack. But importantly, we structure this in such a way that we can, can decode from this auto regressively. Uh, just to, and now to walk you through what that looks like, um, we take our first, um, our first input layer, which is a long context, here illustrated by the text perceiver AR, but this could be any, uh, this could be tokens from any sort of data. All of these become the keys and values of the input. The queries are then the last inputs. So here are the RAR. Uh, the inputs in the future at each point are masked. So this is a masked causal cross attention. And to make this a, the very explicit, uh, the big A sees only perceiver A, and it will be tasked with predicting R at its output. Um, the result of this is that the latents, so the outputs of this cross attention, are now auto regressively ordered. Um, because they're autoregressively auto ordered, we can build a very deep self-attention stack on this. And importantly, we can have a very, very long input and have a, a, a relatively small tractable size for our decoder stack here. 
So this allows us to use decoder-only style causal masking for the, out for the output here. And it gives us complexity that's independent of the input size. So just to give you a sense of the, the kinds of scales that we're talking about here, the input, input can be about 100,000 tokens long, while the latents are about 1,000 to 2,000. So the, the kinds of sizes that we're used to dealing with with large language models. And um, this, this really does um, allow us to practically scale up the size of our architectures. So if we look at the, the typical scaling properties of a transformer here, and th these are real numbers um, on a TPU v3 with a batch size of one. These, this isn't as optimized as it can be, but the overall, um, the overall conclusion will hold, even if you apply like the full set of tricks you can to, to optimize these models. With a normal transformer, as you increase the size, so the depth of the architecture, and the context length, you find that very quickly you run out of, uh, out of memory. So in this particular example, um, you can't fit any model with a context of length of 4096 in memory. If we move to a transformer XL, we can see the story is a little better. So we can get a quite shallow network, uh, so a six layer network in with a context length of 8192, but we really can't move any further than that. With the Perceiver AR, we can fit even very deep architectures um, in with a very long context length. And the reason this happens is because we've decoupled the compute and memory requirements of context length from those of depth. So this allows us to build practical, um, actually models that we can train on real hardware um, in with very large uh, depth and, and width. Um, and in practice, this, this helps a lot. So we can use the same architecture on a variety of domains. So first we look at um, ImageNet 64 by 64, and this is a density modeling benchmark. So we report the results in bits per dim. Uh, lower here is better. And you can see that this, 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 um, this choice of architecture allows us to beat previous autoregressive transformers and get likelihood results that are comparable to the best diffusion modeling on this result, on this, on this data set. And that diffusion, um, that diffusion result is using a, an architecture that can see the entire image, which is basically what, what we can do with this Perceiver AR, but previous autoregressive models could not do. The same model um, gets state-of-the-art results on the long context Project Gutenberg data set. And um, I don't want to spend too much time on this result in particular because um, what we noticed is that this architecture, Perceiver AR, overfits dramatically on this. And the reason for this is you can, you can fit entire books in context memory. So once you are in this sort of position, you no longer reason about the number of tokens in your data set. You have to think about the number of books. And there are about 20,000 books here, and the model can memorize them. So if you actually take samples from this, um, this model, it, it can, it, it, we found that it would spit out Don Quixote as a whole which is a bit crazy. Um, so just a probe to make sure that the model can actually use long context. We tried it on a very simple sort of random byte copy task. And uh, what we're looking at here is uh, 65,000 random input bytes that we then mirror. And we train the model to recapitulate the input um, as the output. And what we found here is that um, the model was able to get a perfect performance on a two to the on two to the 17 inputs. So basically, um, it's the the maximum coffee distance here is is 130,000. It's able to perfectly do this prediction. So the model is able to effectively use this long context. Um, and one of the other cool things about this is that this ability to sort of look over very long range gives us freedom in how we model very long context data from other modalities. So um, when we're training on images, we usually will uh, model things by uh, first using RGB context. And so spatial co coherence is easy to model here, even with short context, because the red, green, and blue pixels from one point are all next to each other. So we can just copy them, and there's not much information change. But um, if we change the order, so first predict all the red, then predict all the green, then predict all the blue, the model becomes much harder. And so what we find is that um, by using this longer context, we can produce the exact same results regardless of the order that we pass the, model, the, the data into the model, which suggests that this is a way to get around the inductive bias that comes from how we order our inputs. So just by looking at everything, you don't have to worry about this problem. Um, we also find that in practice, um, the, the model produces very long coherent um, samples uh, when trained on a music generation task. And so I'm going to play a sample here. So this is a model that's trained on um, to generate uh, piano music from the Maestro data set. And the thing I want you to notice is that there's a repeated motif that, uh, that's reiterated a few times and gradually becomes varied. And so the tempo changes gradually, smoothly increasing and decreasing. 
and the, the harmonic content changes as well, but we still see the same melodic pattern. So we find the same model is able to sample from ImageNet unconditionally. I'm going to skip some of this real quick. Um, and um, with some optimization, we're able to get image sampling down to uh, reasonably tractable speeds. Um, and so we find that the, the model, um, by expanding the context, so on the books data set, which is an internal Google long, long context data set, we find that with the same parameter count, um, by increasing the context by a factor of about a 16, we can still get the same, uh, just a mild reduction in the train, um, train steps per second while getting consistently improving results. Um, and if we compare match compute to Transformer XL, we find that uh, basically at a match steps per second um, rate, we get, um, we get consistently better results, which suggests that this is basically um, a good way to incorporate longer context without like an increase in compute, in compute requirements. Uh, I'm just going to skip over this a little bit, um, but basically you can um, use the model, um, take a pre-trained model and, and uh, change the number of latents that are actually used in the model and get uh, comparable results, or you can increase the number of latents at test time to get improved results. So basically this is a model that can be very easily deployed um, with different compute requirements um, in order to get uh, better uh, output results. Um, and just to, to give you a sense of what the takeaways here are, um, basically we find that uh, greater context uh, makes you insensitive to ordering, which allows you to handle, uh, easily handle new modalities. Um, we can smoothly modify the compute requirements from train to test, so, um, which gives us the ability to deploy this model um, on increasing hardware, um, if we have it, to get better performance, or to deploy it uh, in, in uh, edge-like situations where we don't have the same compute requirements. Um, and we find that um, at a reasonable scale, uh, we can incorporate much more context, which allows us to get state-of-the-art numbers on a variety of different tasks. Uh, and finally, um, Perceiver AR itself is very simple to implement. So basically take a decoder-only transformer, replace the input layer with a cross-attention, and set up the masking, and you're good to go. And so this can also be used as sort of an adaptation for existing decoder-only transformers, which is something that we're exploring in the future. Um, so this, this work was published at ICML, and it was done in collaboration with a large group of people um, at, at uh, Google Brain and at DeepMind. Um, so these are the folks who've contributed to the, the Perceiver line of work in general, and to Perceiver AR in particular. And I encourage you to check out um, our Jax code, um, the author notes here, and um, check out the blog on the Magenta website for more samples from the music model. Yeah, thanks for your time. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have questions? Maybe I can start with a question for uh, uh, Rodrigo. How, well, how would your prompts look like if you can <laughs> have 100,000 tokens in your... Do you want it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're pushing. Uh, it seems that the perplexity didn't fail much when you increase the context. Is that correct for the books data set? So it falls consistently. So um, we do find that there is a trade-off. So there's a point at which the comp um, increasing the context length doesn't um, decrease the perplexity. So there is something like a sweet spot in there. So I think one of the things that we really need to dial, like to really nail uh, now, is what the scaling laws look like when we take context into account. So in, in sort of most settings, what we're thinking about, we, we use a very fixed context length, and we, we use this to reckon about like what the optimal trade-off is compute. The numbers are going to change when you actually think about increasing the context as well. Right. Yeah. And, but another question, have you tried on the quality data set? That, uh, the ones that are, is, you have to answer questions from books? It's pretty long. We haven't yet. This, it came after, out after the, the, the paper, but um, it's something, I, I think it's a really cool data set. Both quality and quality are quite cool. Other questions? I can ask another. Thanks. Great talk. Do you think that um, 
modeling images and sequences of pixels, and over density modeling, this is often done. Do you think that doing so and then letting this cross attention layer figure out what the order should be, that that is the right way to go for images? Um, I think it's essentially as good as any other choice. So right now, we're, we're, there's kind of a, an ongoing dialectic between uh, between diffusion models and between autoregressive models. I think they have um, they have sort of there's a trade off between them. But um, for my money, the most impressive of the of the the sort of the recent image to uh, text to image uh, models was Party. So in particular, they have very very clean scaling laws, and um, they're able to re to reconstruct text and images incredibly well, which none of the, mo the other models were able to do. Um, I don't think model modeling raw pixels is the pragmatic thing to do. So in this setting, it's more just kind of a benchmarking thing. I think the way to actually go is to use something like a VQ codec to compress things and then model in that space. But the autoregressive decomposition is a very, very good one. Um, and I think it's really up to diffusion models to sort of prove that they're as general as autoregressive models are. So diffusion models work great. They don't work everywhere. Cool. Makes sense. Thanks.